going to talk about humeral shaft fractures and whether Simiantos paper is still relevant now. So starting on humeral shaft fractures, the incidence is about 3 to 5 percent of all fractures and there's a bimodal age distribution. One is young patients who suffer a high energy trauma, usually motor vehicle accidents and penetrating injuries, as well as the elderly osteopenic patients who have low energy injuries, um, typically falls, sustaining these humeral shaft fractures. The relevant anatomy, uh, one is about the compartments of the humerus. There's an anterior and posterior compartment separated by a lateral and medial intermuscular septum. And then the radial nerve has a very close relationship to the humerus. It lies in the spiral groove, crosses the posterior humerus at about 14 centimetres proximal to the lateral epicondyle, and it lies directly posterior to the humerus for about 6.5 centimetres. It then pierces the lateral intermuscular septum and enters the anterior compartment about 10 centimetres proximal to the lateral epicondyle. The landmark paper uh, that was referred to in the title was written by Augusto Sarmiento. He was an orthopaedic surgeon born in Colombia and he uh, was mentored by Austin Moore and John Charnley when he moved to America. His major contribution to orthopaedics was one, functional bracing as well as the management of diaphyseal fractures. And he also uh, invented a failed prosthesis made of titanium alloy uh, and dabbled in total hip replacement surgery. He was the past president of AOS as well as the American Hip Society and he's been the chair of the Department of Orthopedics in the University of Miami as well as USC. So the paper was published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 1977 and was titled Functional Bracing of Fractures of the Shaft of the Humerus. It looked at 51 patients with humeral shaft fractures, the majority having fractures secondary to falls but also um, a var variety of other causes such as MBAs, gunshot wounds and twisting injuries. Importantly, two of them were pathological due to metastatic breast cancer. The location, again, there were nine in the proximal third, 26 in the middle third and 16 in the distal third. And they had a variety of ages from 14 to 75 with the median age being 38 years of age. The technique described in that paper was initially mobilization using a variety of different methods such as traction, a sugar tongue cast or a hanging cast. And once the pain subsided, they then started the functional bracing with an elbow in the sling at 90 degrees. Importantly, they allow for immediate elbow and wrist range of movement and started pendular exercises within a week after bracing. They found that the functional brace was worn, worn for about seven weeks and at the final follow-up, 42 out of the 51 patients had full elbow and shoulder range of movement compared to the other side and only nine of them had uh, loss of abduction, and even this was less than 15 degree loss of the shoulder joint. There were six radial nerve palsies, all of which showed spontaneous recovery, and there was one non-union, but this was in a patient with a pathological fracture who was also receiving chemotherapy. And the most common deformity was a various deformity, but again, they found that it was, um, it was not affecting the patient uh, cosmetically or functionally. So the conclusion drawn was that up to 30 degrees of angulation was acceptable. Um, the deformity does not limit pronation and supination, and it was minimal, um, there was minimal morbidity associated with this type of management, uh, non-surgical management. There are a few arguments against functional bracing. Uh, one is that the functional bracing relies on a centrifugal force to maintain the reduction, and therefore in the leg, such as the femur, the muscles form um, sort of cylindrical arrangement around the femur and therefore there's compression from all directions. Whereas in the arm, because the muscles are arranged in anterior and posterior configuration, it, um, there is less circumferential force which the brace can use, um, take advantage of. And therefore it relies on an intact intermuscular septa to prevent deforming forces. So in high energy trauma where the septa might be ruptured, the functional bracing might not be suitable. Uh, and again, in an age group, uh, the Sarmiento paper was not representative of the elderly population with the median age only being 38. And the elderly patients often require gait aids to mobilize and internal fixation enables early return to weight bearing through a gutter frame rather than functional bracing. As, and finally, fracture pattern was not specifically described in the paper. So different patterns might have different rates of union, which was not touched on. So looking at the current evidence, um, 
the, there was a systematic review of 98 patients in 1966 in a paper by Kleneman and all in the JBJS, and they uh, described that an acceptable and compatible level of function was achieved with less than 20 degrees of angulation in the sagittal plane, less than 30 degrees of varus or valgus angulation, and a limb shortening of less than 2 to 3 centimetres. Samienta had a follow-up paper in 2000 published in JBJS, and this was a long-term follow-up of 620 patients managed with functional bracing between 1978 and 1990. The non-union rate post-functional bracing was only 7 to less than 2% in closed fractures and 6% in open fractures. And he described average time to union between 9 to 14 weeks regardless of whether it was open or closed. And the predominant deformity was... Uh, um, less than 5 degrees angulation in the sagittal plane and less than 10 degrees varus of valgus deformity. Again, this was described to be functionally and aesthetically acceptable for the patients. And they found that the fracture location showed no difference to the outcome of functional bracing. One of the pitfalls that was also described in that paper was that the technique, as recommended by Sami and Toe, had to make sure that the medial part of the brace went up to two and a half centimetres below the axilla to 1.3 centimetres above the medial epicondyle. And laterally, it had to range from the chromium to the lateral epicondyle. This allowed for full range of, range of movement at the shoulder and elbow, but allowed for adequate reduction of the fracture site. Typically, failure of bracing that we see now is uh, in the proximal shaft fractures, and that's because the medial brace is usually short of the axilla, far short than the two and a half centimetres that Samienta described, which causes destruction and displacement of the fracture rather than reduction. So currently in literature, the indications for surgical management of tumoral shaft fractures is an open fracture, vascular injury, a floating elbow, impending pathological fracture, polytrauma, as well as failure of close management, which includes the functional bracing. One of the surgical options available is intramedullary nailing. The advantage of this is there's decreased periosteal stripping, and as Mr. Hall um, loves to touch on, disrupt, uh, minimal disruption of fracture biology. The disadvantages is, of course, post-operative shoulder pain and rotator cuff weakness, because um, a lot of the anterograde techniques involves splitting the rotator cuff muscles, and it doesn't allow for exploration of the radial nerve if needed. The advantage of internal plate fixation is that it, um, it allows for direct visualisation, anatomic reduction and compression of the fracture site, and it facilitates exploration of the radial nerve, and the shoulder and elbow joints are not violated. The disadvantages, of course, is iatrogenic injury to the radial nerve, as well as periosteal stripping to allow for plate to be placed. Historically, it's been described that you need eight cortices of fixation for um, when you're using internal plate fixation and a minimal of three to four screws in each of the um, fracture fragments. But recent studies have shown that the working length of the plate is more important than the number of cortices of fixation and that increased spacing between the screws actually provides advantages. And dual plating of the distal third humeral fractures allow for early immobilization, so that's recommended as well. Looking at intramedullary nailing versus open reduction internal fixation, there was a paper published by Changalani in the International Journal of Orthopaedics in 2007, which described that the rate of nerve injury was similar for iron nailing versus plating, with one axillary nerve injury in the iron nail group and one radial nerve injury in the plating group. They also described that the infection rate was four times higher with plating. However, this is the only pa paper which has such a high infectious rate, um, while other papers don't have such a high Another paper in 2010 showed that plating resulted in improved range of movement at the shoulder and elbow, um, which is expected given that the, um, those joints are not really um, explored during internal fixation, and there's less pain and disability. But there is delayed union. Um, 10 of 20 patients with IM nails, so about 50% of patients with IM nails had delayed union, and there was 15% um, shoulder dysfunction in IM nails. So that paper concluded that plating was better. Um, there were two other studies in 2000 and 2009 which were randomised control studies which found that there were no significant difference in shoulder and elbow function and reoperation complication rates were higher in the IM nailing groups. So just given the different results in all these papers which have come out sort of in the same time period, I think it depends mostly on surgeon capabilities and surgeon preference rather than anything uh, as long as adequate reduction is reached. Um, other complications with 
humeral shaft fractures, one is radial nerve palsy. So this occurs in about 11% of humeral shaft fractures, and it's more common in distal rather than proximal shaft fractures, with about 23% of distal shaft fractures showing a radial nerve palsy, and only 1.8% of proximal humeral shaft fractures having radial nerve palsies. And again, transverse spiral fractures more commonly um, see this palsy rather than oblique or comminuted fractures. This could be due to the nerve being on stretch, secondary to the fracture, with um, yep, um, or partial or complete transaction of the nerve. Spontaneous recovery is seen in about 70% at seven weeks. Surgical exploration is recommended if there are indications present for internal fixation of the fracture, as I touched on earlier. So if you go in to do an operation on humeral shaft fractures, it's important to explore the nerve uh, if there's a pre-op palsy, or if there's a new palsy post-closed reduction, um, in case the nerve has been caught unknowingly with, uh, during a closed reduction. In all of the circumstances, uh, studies have found that there's no difference between early surgical intervention versus observation. So they recommend about six months of observation and then a nerve conduction study if the radial nerve does not return. And importantly, splinting of the fingers and wrist until the nerve does return to prevent contractures. The advantage of delayed surgery is that there's avoidance of unnecessary surgery and it allows time for the nerve sheath to heal without disruption of environment. Secondly, in osteoporotic bone, uh, there's recommendation that two locking screws is adequate per fracture segment, and more than two screws might actually... Um, so there's a, there used to be an understanding that more than two screws would provide extra stability, but there was a paper in 2010 looking at cadaveric models of fresh frozen elderly osteoporotic bone that showed three or more screws actually led to a lower load to failure, and there was no increased advantage in axial or torsional stability. In terms of non-union, um, there's atrophic non-union, and papers describe that this, therefore, if you go and do a revision surgery, there's need for biologic stimulation. A uh, paper in 2006 in JBJS found that there were no differences between using autologous bone graft versus demineralized bone matrix, and at about four months, the union rate was similar. <laughs> what is that? Uh, that's probably 100. Yeah, it was 100%, sorry. It's 100% uh, for bone graft and 92 at four points. <laughs> it was hypertrophic, hypertrophic, hypertrophic. <laughs> um, but they did find that there was 44% donor site morbidity in autologous bone grafting with uh, infection and persistent pain, so they were advocating for demineralized bone matrix. And you can also use fibular strut grafting. If there's hypertrophic non-union, then there's a need for more rigid fixation and bone graft is not necessarily indicated. There was a paper um, by Brinker and Owl in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma in 2007 that found that patients, that 84% of patients that suffered a non-union had either a thyroid, parathyroid, calcium or vitamin D level deficiency. And out of those 37 patients they looked at, eight achieved union post purely medical treatment without needing for revision surgery. So in conclusion, functional brazing, when carried out correctly, has a high rate of union. Union and return to function time is about seven weeks, which is very comparable to surgical recovery time as well. The role for surgical management in humeral shaft fractures is there are very specific indications, and the method of treatment depends on associated neurovascular injury as well as surgeon preference. <laughs>